All right, we are continuing our study through the letter of 1 Peter here on the Listener's Commentary. And in this session, we're going to be looking specifically at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. And in this paragraph, Peter resumes his discussion of trials and how to think about them and how to respond to them as the people of God. He paused that topic for just a brief second in chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, to to really give some instructions to the people of God. And now as a church, how do you live together when there's hostility and tension from the outside? And he just wanted to remind them of the importance of their relationship together. But here, he then returns to really the main theme of this whole bigger section, and that theme is trials and how to think about them and how to talk about them. So this is what he says in verse 12. He says, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though something strange were happening to you. And notice he describes their trial as a fiery ordeal. Um, perhaps that even captures up the idea of being tried and tested by fire, like we saw in chapter 1, verse 7, like being refined by fire, as uh, chapter 1, verse 7 says. Maybe this captures up that idea. But their trial is a fiery ordeal, a fiery difficulty is the idea. And Peter says, don't be surprised by it. Don't think it's strange. It's actually the verb form of the noun that's translated strange uh, in the second half of this verse. So don't think it's strange when you experience hostility and uh, the purging fires of suffering that come among you. And this reminds us that trial, hardship, hostility for our faith in Jesus is not something unusual or surprising to following Jesus. It's actually part of it. The apostles regularly teach this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, Paul says that they shouldn't be disturbed by their afflictions. He says, we were destined for this. Um, Paul says in Acts chapter 14 to the leaders that he's appointing in the churches and to the churches that he just recently started, that it's through many tribulations that we, or many trials that we enter the kingdom of God. Jesus said, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. So in the same vein, Peter says, don't look at this suffering and this difficulty as something strange, like it shouldn't be happening. It's just part of following Jesus. In fact, He says it has a purpose. It's for your testing. Interestingly, the word that he uses for testing here isn't like dokimazo dokimas, which he has used earlier in the letter. The word that he uses for testing here is pyrosmos. And pyrosmos is the word that's regularly translated trial in the New Testament or temptation in the New Testament. It's translated both of those. A trial is a test from the outside. A trial is a test that comes from our own desires or from the inside. Both are tests, and that's the idea. It's a test of our loyalty and faithfulness to Jesus. And so this fiery ordeal is coming upon you as an opportunity to test your loyalty and your faithfulness to Jesus. Then in verse 13, Peter goes on to give some really important perspective about these trials, about this testing that they're experiencing. He says this in verse 13, But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that at the revelation of his glory you may also rejoice and be overjoyed. So here's the important perspective. Such trials are sharing in the suffering of the Messiah. To to share in really is the idea of to participate in, to partner in, to have something in common. And so you're you have in this is something you have in common with the Messiah. You're partnering in his sufferings. And the phrase, the sufferings of the Messiah are the sufferings that Jesus endured and experienced that culminated in his death, his rejection by men that Peter mentioned in chapter 2. But this phrase probably also refers to uh, the idea of the things that Jesus the Messiah has and is suffering on behalf of the world, for the sake of redeeming the world. The the Jews had this idea to to speak of the times of the suffering of the Messiah that was really part of 
leading up to the end of all things and the culmination of all things. And so to suffer for Christ is to suffer with Christ for the purposes of Christ. We're identified with him. And so our sufferings are part of his sufferings for the sake of the world. And so Peter says, that's what you're, that's what you're experiencing to the, to the degree that you share in the very sufferings of Jesus, the Messiah, keep on rejoicing. When we view our sufferings this way as sharing in the Messiah's sufferings for the sake of the world, well, then we have fresh perspective and it changes how we respond. And how do we respond? Well, we rejoice and we don't just rejoice once, we keep on rejoicing. And again, this is something that Jesus taught Peter and us, right? Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice And be glad, Jesus says. And Peter had lived this. Uh, Read, for example, Acts chapter 5, verse 41. And after being flogged by the Sanhedrin, Peter and the rest of the apostles went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus. Like, they had just been whipped, and they went on their way rejoicing. And so, Peter's lived this. He learned it from Jesus. He's lived it. He's passing it on to us. Keep on rejoicing in Jesus, he says, so that at the revelation of his glory, so that when Jesus comes and his glory is made known to everybody, you may rejoice with great celebration. That word in this translator that's translated overjoyed is the idea of celebrating. You may rejoice with celebration is the idea. Then the next verse makes it clear that Peter actually has this beatitude of Jesus in mind, that beatitude that I have quoted a couple times here. Blessed are you when people insult you from Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. Well, Peter clearly has it in mind. Notice what he says in verse 14. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. To be blessed means, really, it's the idea of good fortune on you. Or another way to say it is God's favor on you. And in the case of us as God's people, that's more the sense. God's favor on you. So to suffer with and for Jesus means God's favor is on you. You you are blessed. You're experiencing God's good fortune. Indeed, Peter says, God's very own spirit, his spirit of glory rests upon you in this. And so he clearly has this beatitude of Jesus in mind where he learned this truth that suffering doesn't mean you're outside of the presence or the will of God. It means you're actually being favored and blessed by God when you're suffering faithfully for Jesus. Then in what follows, Peter restates what he has said several times, that he's talking about suffering for your beliefs and practices in the way of Jesus. You're not just experiencing difficulty because of wrong and stupid stuff we've done, right? He says this in verse 15. He says, make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. And so you're not supposed to suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer, he says, which is just a general term for doing bad stuff, a wrongdoer. Uh, you're not supposed to suffer as a troublesome meddler. What does that mean? Well, this is the actually the first known use of this word in all extant Greek literature, troublesome meddler. Uh, And that makes it a little bit hard to know exactly what Peter meant by it, since we don't have a whole lot of other places to compare it to. It could mean um, just a meddler in someone else's business. It could mean meddling in affairs beyond your concern, even like political affairs beyond your concern. We're just not 100% sure exactly if Peter had something more narrow in mind or if he just meant more the general idea of troublemaker. And so it's probably best just to take it in that general sense Um, And then reflect on various ways that might play out. So don't suffer as a troublemaker in and about town. Peter's called us regularly to be known as doing good. But suffering as a Christian, he says, is no cause of shame. It's actually a reason to praise and glorify God. And the word Christian is only used a few times in the New Testament. It's used here, and it's used in Acts 11.26, and it's used in Acts 26.28. And in Acts, it appears on the lips of unbelievers as a description for followers of Jesus. 
and it actually appears to, uh, as best as we can tell, to be like a term of contempt or a way of poking fun at followers of Jesus, which actually may explain why Peter uses it here. Um, I could almost imagine Peter like putting quotes around it if they had quote marks. They just didn't have quote marks in Peter's day. But if they had quote marks, I can imagine saying, if you suffer, quote unquote, as a Christian, like if it's a term of contempt, a way of poking fun at you, it's a way to capture up uh, the way unbelievers would use slanderous and ridiculing names for, for followers of Jesus. And so if you suffer as a follower of Jesus, that's no cause for disgrace, no reason to be ashamed. It's actually a motivation to praise and glorify God. Why? Why should he or she not be ashamed but, but glorify God? Well, verse 17 is going to give the reason. It actually begins with because... The word hadi in Greek is because. And so notice verse 17, 4, literally because. Why should you not be ashamed but glorify God? Well, because it's time for judgment to begin with the household of God. Peter has already mentioned that suffering is a form of purifying and refining. We saw that in chapter 1, verse 7. Elsewhere in the New Testament, it can talk about suffering as a form of discipline. For example, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3 and following. Uh, and judgment often means more uh, than what we would call criminal judgment. It often means more what we would call civil judgment. That is, sorting out who's in the right and who's in the wrong. And those in Christ are God's house, God's family. Um, and here, particularly in the context of uh, the full context of Peter's letter, house or household probably has the idea of temple. Uh, he's already used that for God's people quite extensively in chapter 2. So the idea seems to be that God is purifying and refining his temple, his people, through the, the means of unjust treatment at the hands of unbelievers. God is using this as a way to, to purify and to refine and to discipline his people so that, that it'll be a pure, clean, holy temple, holy people for God. That seems to be the idea of what is meant by judgment beginning with the household of God. And then he goes on in the second half of the verse and says, and if it begins with us, if this purifying, disciplining judgment begins with us first, God's people, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it's with difficulty with, that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? What Peter is saying is, if God's people suffer like this as part of their purifying judgment, well, what will judgment be like for those outside of Christ? In verse 18, when he says, if it's with difficulty that the righteous person is saved, what will become of the godless one and the sinner? Well, that's a direct quote from the Septuagint version of Proverbs 11.31. Now, the version in most of our Bible translations is from the Masoretic text, not the Septuagint. So if you look up Proverbs 11.31, it's probably going to sound a little bit different. But in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, this is a word-for-word -word quote from Proverbs 11.31 in that version of it. And in the context of Proverbs 11, the difficulty with which the righteous are saved seems to refer to their suffering. In other words, it fits the context perfectly here. That the way of salvation travels through the valley of suffering, and it's hard. Um, and so if that's the case for God's people, the righteous people, if they have to go through hardship and hostility and difficulty on the path of salvation, well, what's going to become of the godless person and the sinner? We can only imagine that the outcome for them is going to be so much worse than the suffering that, that God's people experience now. And so Peter then ends the section with a word of instruction, a word of encouragement for believers on what to do as they encounter suffering, to what to do as they walk through this valley of hardship and difficulty on the path of salvation. Peter says this in verse 19. He says, Therefore, 
those also who suffer according to the will of God are to entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. That phrase, doing what is right, is our phrase, in doing good. This has been Peter's refrain all throughout the letter. Keep doing good. Be known as doing good. And so as you're doing good, if you suffer for it, well, then here's what you should do. You should entrust your soul to a faithful creator. Uh, and your soul really means your whole self, your whole being. Like entrust your whole self to, to God. And who is God? Well, God's your faithful creator. He's faithful. He's trustworthy. He's the creator of all things. So he's in charge of it all. He can be counted on to sort it all out and to do what's right. So just keep doing good. Keep doing what's right. Keep... Uh, living for the will of God, loving your neighbors, serving your community, and doing what's right. And if you suffer for it, just trust God that he'll sort it all out and he'll make things right in the end. And so how should we think about sufferings on behalf of Christ? Well, Peter says they're tests. They're tests of our faithfulness and loyalty. We should think about them that way. They're, they're sharing in Jesus's suffering. They're to be expected. They're not abnormal. They're not strange. They're part of following Jesus in the present time. Um, they actually entail God's blessing. Blessed are you when this happens to you. And they're a form of judgment. Not judgment in the sense of condemnation, but judgment in the sense of discipline, purification, and refining. They help, they help purify us um, and uh, discipline us for the sake of righteousness. And what should we do when we encounter hostility and hardship, according to what Peter says here? Well, we should make sure that we're suffering for doing good according to God's will, right? We should be, be sure that that's the reason. We're not a murderer, a troublesome meddler, a wrongdoer. No, we're doing God's will and we're doing good. Make sure that's the reason we're suffering. We should rejoice and be glad and we should entrust our whole self to God, knowing that he is our faithful creator who can sort it all out in the end. That's Peter's advice for us as we face hardship and suffering on our way to glory. Hey, it's John. Before we leave this session, I just wanted to remind you that the Listener's Commentary is a crowdfunded Bible teaching effort that's made possible by the generosity of tons of people just like you. And so if you've been touched in some way, you've been impacted in some way, blessed in some way by the Listener's Commentary, could I just ask you to prayerfully consider supporting the commentary? You can set up a monthly uh, donation, a recurring donation at uh, the link in the notes down below at the give page at listenerscommentary.com. Or another way to support the ministry and get some premium content for yourself is to sign up for the Study Hub. And if you sign up for the Study Hub, you get access to tons of extra Bible study tools and resources inside the Hub. And at the same time, you also support the Listener's Commentary, the Bible in Life, and this entire Bible teaching ministry. So if you've been impacted in some way by what God is doing through the Listener's Commentary, would you prayerfully consider supporting this work?